Hi, I'm Sos Eltis. I'm a teacher in English at Brasenose College, Oxford, and I want to talk to you about radical faith in Jane Eyre. So, the role of religion in Jane Eyre. More specifically, what I want to do is to challenge the notion that Jane's religious beliefs are about self-repression and self-denial, about cutting herself off from the man she loves and demanding that um, her faith demanding that she ignores her own deep feelings and passions. So absolutely, it is Jane's Christian faith, um, the morality that goes with it, that leaves her to, leads her to leave Rochester rather than becoming his mistress. But it's also important to recognise how Jane's faith is positioned throughout the book as a whole and how it relates to her self-realisation and self-assertion. Um, Jane's faith, in fact, rather than being about self-denial, in many ways is about self-assertion, about the strength to be who she is, to assert that, to fulfil her individual desires and to gain recognition and respect for who she really is, not for what others wish her to be and try to mould her into being. Now, as part of this, it's important to understand, I think, um, how the book was received when it was first published. So one of the most famous reviews at the time was by Lady Elizabeth Rigby, um, who was outraged by Jane Eyre in the novel. So she found the novel incredibly powerful. Um, she believed that it was original and that incredibly truthful in its depiction of suffering. At the same time, she criticised the writing as coarse, um, vulgar, and importantly, condemned Jane's religion as irreligious, in fact. So what I'm going to do is give you um, quotes from Jane's, uh, from Lady Elizabeth Rigby's review. So she wrote in the quarterly review, it is true that Jane does right and exerts great moral strength, but it is the strength of a mere heathen mind, which is law unto itself. No Christian grace is perceptible upon her. She has inherited in fullest measure the worst sin of our fallen nature, the sin of pride. The doctrine of humility is not more foreign to her mind than it is repudiated by her heart. It is by her own talent, virtue and courage that she is made to attain the summit of human happiness. And Lady Elizabeth continues, altogether, the autobiography of Jane Eyre is preeminently an anti-Christian composition. There is throughout it a murmuring against the comforts of the rich and against the privations of the poor, which, as far as each individual is concerned, is a murmuring against God's appointment. There is a proud and perpetual assertion of the rights of man, for which we find no authority either in God's word or in God's providence. There is that pervading tone of ungodly discontent, which is at, at once the most prominent and most subtle evil which the law and pulpit, which all civilised society, in fact, has at the present day to contend with. We do not hesitate to say that the tone and mind and thought which has overthrown authority and violated every code human and divine abroad and fostered chartism and rebellion at home is the same which has also written Jane Eyre. In other words, Lady Rigby, her version of Christianity is one that is clearly that of divinely sanctioned hierarchy that the privations of the poor and the comforts of, of the rich, the separation between the classes and the enormous economic gap between them is one that God has appointed. Um, and that in her view, God has created rich and poor, masters and men, employers and servants, and they should all know and accept their place. Discontent and pride, in her view, especially pride from a effectively sort of middle class and working woman like Jane is unsuitable. Um, to be condemned. So she condemns Jane's religion as akin to the spirit of the French Revolution. 
um, her reference to um, the overthrowing authority abroad is very clearly a reference to the French Revolution, which had happened 50 years earlier. And when she says it fostered Chartism and rebellion at home, Chartism was a contemporary, so 1840s, working class political radical movement that was calling for political reform, suffrage for all working men, um, secret ballots and so on. So basically kind of radical democracy for the time. Now, Elizabeth Rigby was not, Lady Elizabeth Rigby, was not the only one to see the novel, to see Jane Eyre as revolutionary in spirit. So, for example, in The Christian Remembrancer, a reviewer declared that every page burns with moral Jacobinism. And again, the Jacobins were a radical political club at the heart of the French Revolution. So what you have in both of these reviews is a sense that religion and morality in the novel are radical, are revolutionary, um, are radically democratic and in many ways opposed to hierarchy and the conventional social order. Now, as I would argue, this is a very, very different religion from the idea that it's all about self-repression and self-suppression and that Jane's religion um, is in any way acting to deny her desires and wishes. Now, one of the reasons why I think religion is often seen as repressive is the form of religion that you see in the male characters in the novel. So there's Mr. Brocklehurst, um, whose version of religion, as he preaches it at Lowood, is all that about um, self-repression for the girls, um, that all the, all the pupils ought to be wearing sackcloth and ashes, basically, that they, they're not allowed curly hair, they're, um, they're meant to be mortifying their flesh um, and becoming sort of not just pure, but also self-denying. Um, at the same time, as hypocritically, his own daughters are, of course, dressed in silks with curly hair and all the curl, you know, curled hair and all the rest of it. Uh, now, Jane is humiliated by Brocklehurst and angry at him and angry at the unfairness of his behaviour and so on. And he's cal she is calmed by Helen Burns, who has no respect for Brocklehurst. Um, she refers to Brocklehurst as both weak and pompous. Um, and importantly, Helen Burns is an enormous religious influence on Jane and preaches to Jane the idea that God is the ultimate arbiter, but also that if Jane's if Jane has faith, it should mean she cares nothing for others' judgment upon her. So in many ways, what Helen is preaching is a religion that's about self-sufficiency and a reliance on your own moral principles. And very importantly, later when Jane visits her Aunt Reed um, and is once again bullied by her um, by her aunt and her cousins. Jane turns back to Helen Burns' dying words, her faith, her doctrine of the equality of disembodied souls. So that equality is one of the fundamental elements in Jane's faith, the fundamental element of equality between people. And this is what comes, if, if you think of the, the most famous sort of declaration of Jane's self-respect and her insistence on her equality with others, importantly, equality with a man who is also her employer. Um, it's that famous sort of romantic, you know, there's the sort of romantic climax in many ways, the novel, where Jane turns to Rochester and says, do you think because I am poor, obscure, plain and little, I am soulless and heartless? You think wrong. I have as much soul as you and full as much heart. I am not talking to you now through the medium of custom, conventionalities, nor even of mortal flesh. It is my spirit that addresses your spirit, just as if both had passed through the grave and we stood at God's feet, equal as we are. So what you have here is Jane's religion is at the absolute heart of her sense of equality and her readiness to assert that equality with anybody else on earth. Now, very often religion in the novel, again, asserted, you know, when it's connected with the um, male characters in the novel, um, one of the most obvious that it's associated with is St. John Rivers, her cousin, whose faith is devout, self-denying, absolutist and all-consuming. 
and who demands of Jane when he asks her to marry him and become a missionary with him, he asks for her complete submission to what he perceives as God's will, for which, as he, as Jane says, he demands that she give up half of herself, that she erase half of her identity. Now, St John Rivers is cold and Jane herself describes him as despotic. He's a tyrant. Same words that she uses of John Reed and the same words that she is ready to use of Brocklehurst. And his, his is a religion that demands self-repression. That's about the, asking for the death, for the denial of half of Jane's identity. And he recognises the body only as something to be overcome, to be mastered. The spirit is um, meant to triumph over the, the flesh, flesh which has no value in itself apart from as a tool to carry out God's will. Now, after St John Rivers has proposed to Jane, if you can call it a proposal, as I, you know, demanded that she marry him for, um, as part of his religious mission, um, she prays for God's guidance. And it's at that point that she hears, that night that she hears Rochester's voice carried on the ether to her. Now, if the novel ends with Jane reunited with Rochester, who loves and values her for who she is, how is Jane's religion part of her complete identity, rather than it being her religion that asks her to deny her feelings and her passion for Rochester? How then is she whole when united with Rochester, but it not be her religion that made her tear herself away from him earlier? The crucial answer to this is a plot point that's often overlooked, which is Rochester's religious conversion in the novel. So Jane's reunion and marriage to Rochester is made possible by the convenient death of Bertha Mason, um, or Bertha Rochester, as she obviously actually is, um, by Jane's own acquisition of wealth and relations so that she's now financially independent and more fully Rochester's social equal. And obviously the crucial change in him that critics often talk about, the loss of his hand, the loss of his sight, this kind of um, humbling and weakening of him that mean he can no longer bully and dominate over Jane. But I'd argue even more crucial and less obvious than those in plot terms is his religious conversion. So, importantly, when he describes the moment when he um the moment a week before this is after he's reunited with Jane he says Jane you think me I dare say an irreligious dog but my heart swells with gratitude to the beneficent God of this earth just now he sees not as man sees but far clearer judges not as man judges but far more wisely I did wrong I would have sullied my innocent flower breathed guilt on its purity the omnipotent snatched it from me. I, in my stiff-necked rebellion, almost cursed the dispensation. Instead of bending to the decree, I defied it. Of late, Jane, only, only of late, I began to see and acknowledge the hand of God in my doom. I began to experience remorse, repentance, the wish for reconcilement to my maker. I began sometimes to pray, very brief prayers they were, but very sincere. Some days since, nay, I can number them four, it was last Monday night, a singular mood came over me, one in which grief replaced frenzy, sorrow, sullenness. I supplicated God that if it seemed good to him, I might be taken from this life and admitted to that world to come, where there was still hope of rejoining Jane. I asked of God at once in anguish and humility if I had not long enough been desolate, afflicted, tormented, and might not soon taste bliss and peace once more that I merited all I endured, I acknowledged that I could scarcely endure more, I pleaded, and the alpha and omega of my heart's wishes broke involuntarily from my lips in the words, Jane, Jane, Jane. So what you have here is Rochester's account of his conversion. At the very, very moment, he cries out Jane and Jane hears it. It's that that makes possible in the scheme of the novel, they're coming together not what happened months before, um, the fire at Thornfield and the death of Bertha and so on. In other, in other words, it's Rocha's repentance, resignation and acquiescence to God's will is the moment that 
God allows him Jane that brings them together. So importantly, in religious terms, if we see this, a kind of Charlotte Bronte has constructed the novel with a kind of um, divinely appointed happy ending, that importantly before, had Jane remained with Rochester when he wanted her to become his mistress, that would have meant erasing and suppressing her principles, her morality and her faith, all of which he was seeking to persuade her from, first trick her around and then persuade her from. In exactly the same way, this would have been suppressing half of herself, just in the same way that were she to have agreed to marry St. John Rivers, that would have meant suppressing her feelings, her emotion, her bodily needs, her body itself. So in that sense, religion is the cornerstone of Jane's self-respect. It's her faith is key to her refusal to become either the woman that St. John Rivers wishes her to be, or the woman that Rochester before his religious conversion wishes him her to be. And at that point, remember, he's trying to dress her up in, in silks and turn her into a woman that she feels very uncomfortable being. It's kind of fighting against her sense of identity. And it's only once Rochester has gained the same, accepted the same religious principles that Jane believes in, that he embraces the whole of her, that he wants her as she is, the whole of her as she is. So. This is why Lady Elizabeth Rigby dislikes and distrusts Jane's religious faith, sees it as rebellious, self-assertive and potentially revolutionary in its basis in equality and its disdain of gender and class hierarchies. Rochester is not her superior by being male nor by being upper class. So Jane does not recognise either men or aristocrats as of more value than herself. She has no submission to what others identify as her role or her place. She trusts her own conscience, her own faith, and her own sense of herself. So in that sense, in the novel, you have Christian religion as appropriated by the likes of Rochester and St. John Brocklehurst and St. John Rivers to assert their own notably despotic power. And it's that religious faith, that appropriation of religious faith that is repressive that is demanding that women give up parts of themselves whereas Jane's Christianity the one that Lady Elizabeth Wrigley hated um, is key it actually validates her own discontent and rebellion it's that that makes her trust her own instincts and reject others um, and gives her the strength of self-assertion and individualism it's a faith that disdains social and gender hierarchies and believes in equality in the eyes of God. And in that sense, you can say it is a truly revolutionary faith.